I will begin this morning with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. amen. Most Holy Virgin Mary, to fulfill the desires of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and in accordance with thy wish made known at Fatima, we consecrate ourselves, our marriages, and our families to thy sorrowful and immaculate heart, O Queen of the Most Holy Rosary. O Immaculate Heart of Mary, rule over us together with the Sacred Heart of Jesus Christ, our King. Save us from the spreading flood of modern paganism, man-centered religion, false ecumenism, and all the sinister attacks against church doctrine on the sanctity of marriage. Kindle in our hearts and families the love of purity, the practice of a virtuous life, an ardent zeal for the salvation of souls, and a desire to pray the rosary more faithfully. We come with confidence to thee, O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, and inflame us with the same divine fire which has inflamed thine own sorrowful and immaculate heart. Make our hearts, marriages, and families thy shrine. And through us, make the heart of Jesus together with thy rule triumph in every heart, marriage, family, and home. Amen. Amen. The title of my talk this morning is My Immaculate Heart Will Triumph purity in marriage and the family. And I've decided to begin with just a very quick summary of the Fatima apparitions, because I'm assuming that there are some souls here present that perhaps aren't as familiar with them. So, the Fatima apparitions can be summarized as follows. There are 12 major divine interventions. First, the three appearances of the Angel of Peace in 1916. Next come the six appearances of Our Lady at Cova da Iria, near the village of Fatima, Portugal, to the three shepherd children, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta. These took place from May the 13th to October the 13th, 1917, one each month. And finally, there are three very significant post-1917 apparitions of Our Lady to Sister Lucia in December 1925 at Pontevedra, Spain, in June 1929 at Tui, Spain, and in January 1944 also at Tui, Spain. In 1925, Our Lady came to request the communion of reparation of the first Saturdays of five consecutive months. In 1929, she asked for the solemn consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart by the Holy Father and all of the world's bishops in union with him. And in 1944, Our Lady directed Sister Lucia to write down the third secret and ordered that it be revealed to the world no later than 1960. We now move on to just a review of seven key things which God asks of us through Our Lady of Fatima. One, the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Two, to reveal to the world the third secret, no later than 1960. Three, pray the rosary daily. Four, wear the brown scapular. This is especially significant for this talk because when we wear the brown scapular, we make a promise to live chastely. It isn't just putting on the brown scapular of Our Lady. It is the Catholic who's making that commitment, renewing that commitment to live a chaste life. Five, to be faithful in accomplishing one's daily duty according to one's state of life, whether bishop, priest, father, mother, husband, wife, children. Six, make reparation, pray and sacrifice 
for the conversion of poor sinners. And seven, on the first Saturdays of each month, make special reparation for sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So, seven key things which God asks of us through Our Lady of Fatima. I'll make just two quick comments. The first one is, note the relationship between praying the rosary daily, wearing the, um, uh, excuse me, praying the rosary daily, um, yes, wearing the brown scapular, and also accomplishing one's daily duty. Notice the relationship there with marriage and the family. There's a, a, a very close relationship Children, with regard to chastity, well, children learn chastity from the example of their parents. The rosary is often prayed and ideally prayed in the family, in the home. Um, and obviously accomplishing one's daily duties, well, that centers also around the family and home, whether one is a father, a husband, mother, wife, children. And in terms of just children learning chastity from the example of their parents, well, remember that yesterday, Father Isaac, he mentioned very specifically the importance of parents' example. And he asked rhetorically, how are you going to raise saints if you're devils? <laughs> well, I'll add this morning, how are your children going to learn to be chaste if you lust. And the second comment that I'll make is this. With regard to all of these uh, key things that God is asking of us through his mother at Fatima, remember that we are to carry out these holy works as best as we can in union with the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And what this means is it means that you make yourself more aware that as you do these things, you want to ask our Blessed Mother to help you to learn to love as she loves. So for example, you can, you can pray as you're, whatever it is you're doing, whether it's wearing the brown scapular, fulfilling your daily duties, uh, making reparation. You can pray something like, Blessed Mother, I want to love and please God with the same love and devotion of your Immaculate Heart. That's why I'm doing what I'm going to do. That's why I'm praying the rosary this evening. Help me carry out the duties of my state of life with love for God and to please Him. Help me to love God as you love God. Help me to labor for the conversion of sinners. You're making reparation for the conversion of sinners or for the sins of others. Help me labor for the conversion of sinners with the same love of your maternal heart. And obviously, notice the very explicit connection between the first and the seventh. The first one was the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the seventh was the devotion of the first Saturdays of each month. There, the connection is very explicit with devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, out of the 12 apparitions, remember, three by the angel, six by Our Lady to the three children, and then the last three by Our Lady to Sister Lucia, I want to focus on some key words spoken by Our Blessed Mother on June the 13th, 1917, and July the 13th, 1917. Listen carefully. She is giving us the answers to the trials of our times. We've been hearing over these days of the great, great trials. Here we have the answer, straight from heaven. Quote, Jesus wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. To whoever embraces this devotion, I promise salvation my Immaculate Heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world. In the end, 
My immaculate heart will triumph. Close quote. Let's zero in on two points. One, if Our Lady's requests are not obeyed, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world. And two, in the end, her Immaculate Heart will triumph. So, we want to consider these two points in light of today's current reality of a battle for marriage and the family that is being waged within the Catholic Church. This in itself is incredible. I hope that all of you will take some time in the weeks to come to consider the significance that there's a battle for the truth about marriage and the family that's, being, that's taking place within the Catholic Church. If it were the Catholic Church fighting against the secular world, well, that's a no-brainer. But a battle taking place within the Catholic Church. And the reality is, I'm kind of uh, quoting, uh, half-quoting Father Isaac also from yesterday. The reality is, is that we have Pope Francis and a host of wicked cardinals who are trampling on church teaching, and to put it mildly, they are betraying Christ. But I say to think about these two points in this context because with a battle for marriage and the family being waged before our very eyes and ears, we have a striking confirmation that Russia has, in fact, spread her errors throughout the world, and now even throughout the church, even to the very top, the chair of St. Peter. That's what we're witnessing today. Please, open your eyes. The errors of Russia are now at the throne of Peter, or the chair of St. Peter. And also, in many ways, these errors of Russia have found their way into many, many, I dare say almost all, individual hearts. Particularly also when it has to do with the virtue of chastity. We're coming to that. Perhaps many people don't realize it, but central to communist ideology is the destabilization and destruction of marriage and the family, especially through feminism, divorce, and abortion. When I say that the errors of Russia have found their way into almost every heart, just think feminism. This is everywhere. These are major errors of Russia, and they are direct attacks on marriage and the family. There's a book titled The Naked Communist, which outlines communist goals and ideology. This book was written in 1958 by W. Uh, w. Cleon Skusen, a former FBI agent, who based his book on some of the best intelligence of the FBI during its investigation of communist infiltration into the United States. According to this book, the following are some of the goals of communism. That is, what Our Lady calls the errors of Russia. Break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. Discredit the family as an institution. Encourage promiscuity, masturbation, and easy divorce. Emphasize the need to raise children away from the influence of parents and present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. Again, the communist plan. On to the second point. As bad as things are, the errors of Russia are throughout 
the Catholic Episcopacy today. As bad as things are, it is equally true, even truer, that in the end, Our Lady's Immaculate Heart will triumph. Let us take some time to reflect on the Virgin Mary's beautiful promise. What does it mean that her Immaculate Heart will triumph? Let's start by asking, what is contained in Mary's Immaculate Heart? Simply put, what is in her heart? Our Blessed Mother's heart, what's in it? St. Bonaventure, doctor of the church, prays, quote, O Mary, I behold in thee an immense grandeur and capacity. Tu Maria, immensissima. I see in thee three kinds of immensity. The first is the immensity of thy blessed womb, which enclosed him who is immense and infinite, whom the heavens and the entire universe cannot contain. The second is the immensity of thy mind and heart, for thy virginal heart is more vastly immense than thy sacred womb. The third is the immensity of thy grace and charity, because thy heart, being immense, replete with grace and charity, the charity and grace that fill it must necessarily be immense. Close quote. What's in her immaculate heart? Her immaculate heart is full of charity and grace. The supernatural charity and grace in her heart are immense. So immense that all of us are able to draw from it. Every single soul that has ever lived. And what your marriage and your family most need are the love of God and the grace of God. And these are found in super abundant measure in Mary's Immaculate Heart. Mary's Immaculate Heart is a vast sea of grace, a measureless ocean of perfections, an immense furnace of love. We don't know the details about how Mary's Immaculate Heart will triumph in the end. But an essential of this triumph will be her grace and charity coming to reign in our hearts, in our marriages, and in our families. Remember, her grace and charity, what's in her heart, are immense. There's enough for all. So on a practical daily level, in order to contribute to the coming triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart, it's coming, guaranteed. We must draw from her immense love of God by emulating as best as we can her love for God. That's what you and I have to be doing. It's essential, it's an essential work to contribute to the triumph of her Immaculate Heart. Now, Mary's love for God is completely pure. Mary is all pure because her love of God is all pure. Mary is the splendor of the saints and the sanctity of all Christians because her love of God is all pure. Don't forget this because this is what is contained in her Immaculate Heart. A love for God that is all pure. I'm going to explain this in a few moments. Mary's pure love of God is the essence of her purity. Listen to the saints. They're going to explain to us, not not I, not little old Father Rodriguez, but the saints are going to explain to us what... It means to say that Mary's love for God is all pure. So, St. John Hughes, quote, The unique heart of Our Lady never knew any love other than the purest love of God. It never suffered from the multiplicity of superfluous thoughts, 
aimless desires, and vain affections, which usually fill and divide the miserable hearts of the children of Adam. Her heart held one thought, one purpose, one will, one intention, one single affection, and one desire only, to please God and to fulfill in all things and everywhere His adorable will." Close quote. And St. John Damascene, doctor of the church, the great defender of holy images against the impious emperor Leo and the iconoclasts, that in the 7th and 8th centuries, states, quote, Thy pure and immaculate heart is always turned toward thy beloved and is applied only to contemplate him, to desire him, to seek him, and to aspire after him." Close quote. So, mark this well. If you're taking notes, I hope somebody is. <laughs> mark this well, write it if you're writing. Mark this well. The Immaculate Heart of Mary stands at the very center of the Fatima message. Immaculate means without stain, without blemish, completely pure. Mary's heart is immaculate because her love of God is absolutely pure, undivided, immense. Her heart is set completely and totally on God, only God. Quote, her heart held one thought, one purpose, one will, one intention, one single affection, and one desire only, to please God and to fulfill in all things and everywhere His adorable will. Close quote. And this is the heart that is going to triumph. Mary's heart is set completely and totally on God. This is also under, mark this down. Mary's heart is set completely and totally on God. This is the defining characteristic of the magnificent heart which we are to emulate in order to contribute to its triumph. This is the heart after which your heart must be shaped. This is the heart after which your marriage must be shaped. And this is the heart after which your family must be shaped. That's what we as Catholics in the 21st, 21st century are supposed to be doing. If we really believe in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we're supposed to be doing our best to meditate on that Immaculate Heart so that we know what is contained in it, and then doing everything in our power to shape our marriages and our families after that heart that is set totally and completely on God. And yet, ask yourselves, I'm going to give you a clue. Remember that yesterday, uh, Father Isaac called you devils, not I. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, what is the usual state of our hearts? What is the usual state of our hearts? One of the main purposes of this conference is to help you to be more honest than you've ever been before in your life, to look at the state of your heart, the state of your marriage, the state of your family, and to recognize that God is calling you to something far, far greater. That's why our Blessed Mother appeared at Fatima. And that with God's grace and the intercession of Our Lady, you can do it. And it doesn't matter how old you are. We have some people that are a little bit older here. It doesn't matter. 70, 80, 90. For God, nothing is impossible. And it's not like God is saying, okay, if you're 85 or if you're seven years old or whatever you may be, or if you're rich or poor, that, well, you, you, you're exempt from shaping your heart after the Immaculate Heart of Mary. 
Not at all. And so what is the usual state of our hearts? St. John Eude says that the miserable hearts, I'm not saying it either, so again, <laughs> I'm just quoting St. John Eude's, Father Isaac. St. <laughs> John Eude's says that the miserable hearts of the children of Adam suffer, suffer, because they are filled and divided by superfluous thoughts, aimless desires, and vain affections. Please remember this and take it to heart, pun intended. The number one thing that your marriage and family needs is Mary's purity, her immense love of God, her heart that is set completely and totally on God. It's the number one thing. Not new clothes, not a new home, not vacations, not even, oh, I need peace in my family. Well, we need that, sure. But the number one thing that your marriage and family needs is Mary's purity. It bears repeating. The number one thing that your marriage and family needs is Mary's heart that is set completely and totally on God. And it's, it's very sad because some of you have experienced this, that when you get more motivated in your Catholic faith and you begin to really work to restore it, starting with the traditional Latin Mass, that many of the people around you and even in your own family, they start criticizing you and telling you that you're fanatical and that you're extreme. There goes that fanatic. There go those radicals. It's so sad. Because you tell me, I'm going to repeat what I just said about Mary's Immaculate Heart, and you tell me if this is not radical. Mary's heart is set completely and totally on God. And then there are people that complain, and they, and they, and they complain about you and say, well, you know, those people, those traditional Catholics, all they do is talk about God. All they do is talk about religion. You know, they, they don't have a life. <laughs> Shows you how sad the state of affairs is in our church today. Because all of us should be shaping our hearts, our marriages, and our families after a heart, namely Mary's heart, that is radically, like we don't know what radical is, radically and totally set on God and God alone. St. Francis of Assisi, he would dwell for hours and hours. Sometimes he would spend the whole night and what he would pray is five simple words, maybe even in honor of the five precious wounds of our Lord, but five, five simple words he would pray, my God and my all. My God and my all, my God and my all. Hours upon hours, St. Francis of Assisi prayed. A heart getting close to being completely and totally set on God. And yet the number one reality of our marriages and families is, we're talking now about the number one reality. I just told you what the number one need is, what we need to work towards. And now the number one reality of our marriages and families is superfluous thoughts, aimless desires, and vain affections. Let's move briefly to the worst desires and affections that are in our hearts, which are those of lust. Our Lady of Fatima and uh, Brendan mentioned this quote, um, probably Father Isaac did too as well, so you're hearing it now for at least the third time this weekend. Our Lady of Fatima revealed to little Jacinta, quote, more souls go to hell for sins of the flesh than for any other reason close quote, i.e. sins of lust. Yesterday, Father Isaac quoted the great doctor of the church, St. Alphonsus Maria Ligori, who teaches the same. This is the number one, I'm doing a lot of number ones. This is the number one plague on our marriages and families, lust. Lust 
is the inordinate seeking of the pleasures of the flesh, venereal pleasure. Of all vices, lust is the most severely punished by God on earth. It was the cause of the great deluge, Genesis chapter 6, and the cause for the fire and brimstone which destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 18 to 19. Chastity or purity, I'm going to use them interchangeably. I hope I'm not making a grave theological error here. Uh, chastity or purity is the opposite of lust. Remember, lust is the inordinate seeking of the pleasures of the flesh. So chastity is the virtue that moderates the desire for venereal pleasure according to God's plan. Especially as God's plan is expressed in our state of life. Chastity orders, it brings order to this desire for venereal pleasure according to the divine will. Again, this is very much related to the message of Our Lady of Fatima, which is also meant to counteract the errors of Russia. Just keep in mind the scapular devotion. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, very much tied to the wearing of the brown scapular is the promise that one makes of chastity, to practice chastity. Chastity is so important because each one of us is called by God to love him and our neighbor in a particular way. That's what we call our vocation. Each one of us has a vocation. That's one of the beautiful ways that God touches each one of our souls. He has a very special mission. The young people here, listen carefully. Each one of us has a very, very special mission. Why God put us on this earth? It's our vocation. And our vocation is, and again, it's a, it's a precious, precious way that God shows us His love for us and how He wants us to love Him and get to heaven. And so in our vocation, basically, it has to do, you, you know, how am I going to follow Christ? In terms of my concrete state of life, how is it that I'm going to follow Christ? As a priest? As a nun? As a husband? As a father? As a mother? As a wife? But it's not just how will I follow Christ, but how will I love Him? How has God called me for however long I'm on this earth, how has he called me to love him? And that's the fundamental call of God. That's also why it's so sad. You have all these seculars, and even, again, you have all these seculars and even criticisms that are being made from the hierarchy, from the church hierarchy, against those that are trying to defend and protect church teaching on the sanctity of marriage. You know, these really sad and tragic comments of things like, oh, well, the Catholic Church is hung up about sex, and the Catholic Church this, and the Catholic Church puts rules, and the Catholic Church wants to be in people's bedrooms. I mean, all of these things, again, diabolical. Um, I, I don't think I'll say it as, for, as forcefully as uh, Father Isaac yesterday, but these things are from hell. The Catholic Church places so much importance on chastity, and rightly she does, because it has to do with how is each soul going to love God in a pure way. There's nothing more important. And it, you better believe this, this is going to require order, because there's a very strong, in our miserable hearts, something that's very strong is the inordinate, out of order, inordinate seeking of the pleasures of the flesh. In terms of our vocation and how, how am I called to love Christ, all of us are to love Him with a love that is chaste. That means a love that is ordered according to my state of life. It's the divine will that is ordering my love and teaching me and telling me how I have to love Him, God, in return. It's not primarily the Catholic Church and rules. That's crazy. 
That just shows how far away hearts are from God. And a love for God's will and hearts that are set above everything on pleasing God and doing His holy will. That's the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So, remember this. Everybody is called to chastity. Everyone. Because everyone is being called to order their love according to the will of God. Married people are called to be chaste. In married people, chastity orders the desire for venereal pleasure to the procreation and education of children. There's no such thing. I'm not going to go into details on this right now, but, you know, there's some Catholic couples that think that, oh, we're married. Anything goes. There's no such thing as anything goes because there can be a lot of lust in Catholic marriages. Married people are also called to be chaste. For more specifics on this, I encourage you to listen to Father Ripperger's conference. He has a conference on YouTube that is titled Chastity in Marriage. He goes into more specifics on or the ordering of venereal pleasure within Catholic marriage. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to focus in just a few moments on what I call foundational principles of chastity, which obviously also includes marital chastity. Single people are called to be chaste. In single people, chastity orders the desire for venereal pleasure by abstention until marriage, if it is that they're called to marriage. Priests and consecrated virgins are called to be chaste. In them, chastity orders the desire for venereal pleasure by a complete and total sacrifice. Does that sound familiar? Complete and total. The Immaculate Heart of Mary, completely, totally set on God and on God alone. So, I want to focus briefly on a foundation of marital chastity. Not, not, not just marital chastity, chastity, but I say marital just so that the, most of you here are married, so that you pay close attention and you open your hearts. I want to focus briefly on a foundation of marital chastity or purity, which is, guess what? Mary's Immaculate Heart. Remember, the number one thing that your marriage and family needs is Mary's purity. Her immense love of God. Her heart that is set completely and totally on God. And where do you think this is going to come from? It's going to come primarily from the grace of marriage and from husband and wife that are living chastely. Remember, children will learn from the example of their parents, even if they can't see your example. The husband and wife, Catholic husband and Catholic wife that are truly living a chaste wedlock, chaste married love, there are going to be innumerable supernatural blessings for their children. Whether they can see it and understand it or not, whether the children see it or understand it or not, and the opposite is also true. If in the miserable hearts of Catholic husband and wife there is disorder and there is lust, that is also going to have profound, obviously negative effects on the children. What does Pope Pius XI teach? Everybody pay very close attention here because this is a profound, profound teaching by Pope Pius XI. Already Father Isaac and also my brother David yesterday, they both quoted from the, the papal encyclical on chaste uh, Christian wedlock, casti nubi, and I'm going to do the same right now. Listen, listen up, please. Pope Pius XI explains in Casti Conubi his encyclical letter on Christian marriage dated December the 31st, 1930, that, quote, unbridled lust is the most potent cause of sinning against marriage. Close quote. The most potent cause of sinning against marriage. 
The Holy Father teaches, quote, Unbridled lust is the most potent cause of sinning against the sacred laws of matrimony. And since man cannot hold in check his passions unless he first subject himself to God, this must be his primary endeavor in accordance with the plan divinely revealed. For it is a sacred ordinance that whoever shall have first subjected himself to God will, by the aid of divine grace, be glad to subject to himself his own passions and concupiscence, while he who is a rebel against God will, to his sorrow, experience within himself the violent rebellion of his worst passions. Close quote. The Holy Father then quotes St. Augustine, quote, Be thou subject to God, and thy flesh subject to thee. Thou art subject to the higher, and the lower is subject to thee. Do thou serve him who made thee, so that that which was made for thee may serve thee. Close quote. And Pope Pius XI goes on teaching, quote, I think this is the direct quote that you also heard yesterday. My, my brother David quoted it. So I, I mentioned to him this morning, I said, David, you stole the thunder from my talk. <laughs> no, it's a great story. This happened just before, the, just before I gave the talk. I, 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 I told that to my brother. And then he says, well, Father, you know, actually, no. He says, actually, I, I, I got that quote from you. Because he says, uh, he says, I was listening to one of the talks you just gave very recently, and I heard that quote. And so I said, oh, and that's a really good quote that fits into my talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's my quote. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's the church's quote. No, but this is something that's so beautiful. As Catholics. It's never a question of, oh, this is my teaching. Oh, I'm right. You're right. You're wrong. It's so sad. This is what happens in the church. Pride gets in the way and people are trying to win arguments and prove things. And I can quote here and I can quote that. And you're wrong because you go to this mass and you go to that other mass. And, we, we're, and we're losing that purity of heart. This is the teaching. These are the teachings of Christ and his church. And they are absolutely true. And this is what we most need, the truth and the light that come from God through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So here's the quote again then, second time you're hearing it, actually better that way, you're hearing it twice, you heard it yesterday, you heard it yesterday in my brother's talk, you'll hear it right now, it's extremely important. So if you didn't pay attention yesterday, pay attention now. <laughs> Pope Pius XI goes on teaching, quote, as the onslaughts of these uncontrolled passions cannot in any way be lessened unless the spirit first shows a humble compliance of duty and reverence toward its maker, it is above all and before all needful that those who are joined in the bond of sacred wedlock should be wholly imbued with a profound and genuine sense of duty towards God, which will shape their whole lives and fill their minds and wills with a very deep reverence for the majesty of God. Close quote. Pope Pius XI, Supreme Pontiff of the Catholic Church. Pope Pius XI is teaching that the number one thing which Catholic husband and wife need, everybody listen up, the number one thing that you need as a Catholic husband and a Catholic wife is, quote, a very deep reverence for the majesty of God, close quote, which will in turn lead them to be, quote, wholly imbued with a profound and genuine sense of duty towards God, which will shape their whole lives, close quote. I hope that every single Catholic father, husband, Catholic mother, Catholic wife that leaves this conference will leave with a stronger conviction that what I need more than anything else is a very deep reverence for the majesty of God. And the deeper it is, the better.
the more immense it is, the better. And it isn't a coincidence that this is the defining characteristic of Mary's Immaculate Heart. It is totally pure, completely and totally set on God. Tu Maria Immensissima. In her heart is an immense reverence for the majesty of God. Her heart has one thought, one purpose, one will, one intention, one single affection, and one desire only. Reverence for the majesty of God, which means to please Him and to fulfill in all things and everywhere His adorable will. And this is the admirable heart which our marriages and families are to emulate in order to contribute to its triumph. So again, how can we accomplish this? We who have miserable slime of the earth hearts, which are so filled and divided by worldly and self-centered thoughts, selfish and lustful desires, and vain affections. How are we going to do it? It is difficult in, in one respect, and that's why so few are living a chaste love, are living purity. But by the same token, it also is not uh, difficult and not impossible. Um, we were given a lot, a lot of ways to do this. I'm just going to offer you a few. I will offer you three simple ways, but first I want to recall a great teaching of our Savior Jesus Christ. This is the sixth of the eight Beatitudes which Jesus taught on the Mount. This is Matthew 5, 8, quote, Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Close quote. And we may add, blessed are marriages that are clean of heart or pure, for they shall see God. Blessed are families that are clean of heart, pure, for they shall see God. And the converse is also true. In seeing God, hearts are made pure. In seeing God, marriages are made pure. And in seeing God, families are made pure. So, I'll come back to this, but I'm going to conclude by offering you three simple ways to emulate the Immaculate Heart of Mary. A unique heart, wholly imbued with an immense and profound reverence for the majesty of God. Mary's Immaculate Heart is an ocean of reverence for the majesty of God, immense, profound. These three simple ways that I'm going to present to you, all of them are taught by the message of Fatima, and all of them are related to seeing God. What I just referenced in that beatitude, Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. All of these three ways have to do with also efforts we need to make to see God, to place ourselves in God's presence, because that is what's going to purify our hearts. So what are these three ways? Nothing new. Again, I'm not coming up with new ideas. I'm simply repeating what is in the message of Fatima and what the Catholic Church teaches. So the three ways, obviously there are others, I chose these three. One, devotion to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. Two, devotion at Mass. Reverence for the majesty of God. The number one place where you're going to acquire the grace of reverence for the majesty of God is at Mass. And this is why, I'm not going to go into a whole talk on this, my brother did some of it yesterday, but I really urge all of you that are here today, I know there are a number of you that aren't as familiar with the traditional Latin Mass, some that are a little bit, but still are going to the new Mass. Another number one, my number one message to you is, start going to the traditional Latin Mass exclusively. 
There's so much to explain. There's not enough time. But one thing is relevant to what I'm saying right now is that, remember, the number one thing that your marriage and your family need is a deep reverence for the majesty of God. I'm not going to go into a whole explanation. Believe me, there, there is. I'm just going to say it very simply. This is profoundly present in the traditional Latin Mass. In the New Mass, it's gone. And that's a huge problem. Relevant also for chastity. Because remember what Pope Pius XI is teaching. He's saying that in order for husband and wife to have a chaste marriage, the number one thing is a deep reverence for the majesty of God. And the third one, devotion to St. Joseph and the Holy Family. We're in the month of March, very appropriate. That's also one reason why I chose this one. I said month of March, St. Joseph, devotion to St. Joseph and the Holy Family. So I'll be finishing now with just saying a few comments about those three simple ways to emulate the Immaculate Heart of Mary in order to contribute to its eventual and certain triumph. One, devotion to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. So here you can practice all forms, all the legitimate forms of devotion to the Immaculate Heart, obviously, especially what's at Fatima in terms of the first five Saturdays. But I just want to highlight very quickly devotion to her Immaculate Conception because this is what gave origin to her Immaculate Heart. When our Blessed Mother was immaculately conceived, also her Immaculate Heart was formed. I will cite a brief passage from The Mystical City of God, which is the most celebrated biography of our Blessed Mother written by Venerable Maria de Jesus of Agreda in the 17th century. Listen to this beautiful quote. She's writing about the Immaculate Conception. So she's writing about um, uh, our Blessed Mother, Baby Mary, uh, 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 about our Blessed Mother in her mother's womb. And she's explaining how in the womb, Mary is already showing an extraordinary and profound reverence for the majesty of God. Here's the quote. The Almighty in His wisdom and goodness had resolved to deposit within this heavenly lady the greatest graces and virtues ever to be given to any other creature for all eternity. And when the hour had arrived for giving them into her possession, the most faithful Lord executed His design showering down all his graces and gifts in the most holy soul of Mary at the time of her conception in such an overpowering measure as no other saint nor all of them combined can ever reach nor ever human tongue can manifest. In the exercise of the theological virtues, she perceived God as he is and as the creator and glorifier. In heroic acts, she reverenced him, praised him, gave him thanks for having created her, loved him, feared him, and adored him, offering sacrifices of worship, praise, and glory because of his immutable being. She recognized the gifts which she had received, and she gave thanks with profound humility and prostrated herself immediately in the womb of her mother, though yet in a body so small and by these acts, she merited more than all the saints in the highest state of perfection and sanctity. Close quote. St. Alphonsus Liguori highly recommends the following devotion. He told parents to train their children to acquire the habit of saying three Hail Marys in the morning and evening. And after each Hail Mary, he advised that the following prayer be said, By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, Make my body pure and my soul holy. What a beautiful devotion for, our, for all our Catholic children to pray in the morning and in the evening, three Hail Marys, and after each Hail Mary, by thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. And again, obviously, when, when St. Alphonsus de Gori says parents should train their children, what's the number, way, what, number one, like another number one, what's the number one way parents train their children? By their example, so you parents, again, don't tell me, Father, I'm 85, that's good. That means you can pray it even more to make up for time in the past that you didn't pray it. Everyone, by thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. 
the parents who are really praying this prayer. The best way to train their children so the children will also pray. And in terms of devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, keep these two truths in mind. Again, there are a lot of different devotions you can choose, but just keep these two truths in mind. Every movement, every beat of Mary's Immaculate Heart is directed to God. Believing in God, adoring God, reverencing God, praising God, honoring God, thanking God, hoping in God, loving God, and giving God perfect glory. And also, number two, that which causes Mary's Immaculate Heart the greatest sorrow and the sharpest pain is when God is offended by sin. And think also here, sins of lust. When he is not adored, not reverenced, not obeyed. On to the second simple way, devotion at Mass, reverence for the majesty of God. And this is also why it's so important that you go to the traditional Latin Mass, because some Catholics will tell me, Father, well, look, uh, everything that's true about the Mass, that it's the holy sacrifice of Christ on Calvary and all these things, well, I believe those things, and I'm concentrating on that when I'm at the, at the new Mass. Look, the main thing is not your effort. Your effort's important. Don't, I'm not saying don't make an effort. And, and let's say there's a Catholic that stubbornly continues to go to the new Mass. Um, it, well, definitely make every effort. I would be the first one to say, definitely make every effort. But one's personal effort is not the most important thing. It's, it's what the church, it's what Christ and the church are, are doing at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And it's something very different going on in the traditional Latin Mass and in the New Mass in many areas, but particularly also with reverence for the majesty of God. And what it means is it means that when I go to Mass, that yes, my effort's important, but the Mass itself, the rite itself, is what is teaching and, and imbuing in my soul and in my heart a reverence for the majesty of God. Obviously, I have to cooperate with it also. I mean, people can go to the traditional Latin Mass, and if they don't make an effort, well, okay, it's not going to have the effect. But what is there in the right is far, far more important than an individual effort. The individual effort is still necessary. The traditional Latin Mass has a great deal to do with fostering chastity, why? Because it has a great deal to do with fostering profound reverence for the majesty of God. And think back about what uh, the Beatitude, where, where we said, Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. At the traditional Latin Mass, there's a whole focus on, you're now in the presence of God. You're now to see God. You need to have a pure heart. The traditional Latin Mass, my brother mentioned yesterday, is theocentric, meaning centered on God. Whereas the new Mass is anthropocentric, centered on man. How can you possibly go to Mass and not be looking to God? That's also why the traditional Latin Mass is offered ad oriente, meaning towards the East, towards God, towards heaven. That's absolutely essential. I cannot possibly understand how we are we continue to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass, the new mass, facing the people. I mean, that is an error of Russia. And not just an error of Russia, that's an error of the devil, that's an error of man. How can the focus be towards man? It, mass has to be directed towards God. We're there to see God, we're there to adore God, we're there to be in the presence of God. Even Pope Benedict, when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger, he wrote a book. Some of you may know about it. It's called The Spirit of the Liturgy. It was published roughly in about 2001. So at that time, he was prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And he wrote this whole book on the liturgy. And this is in 2001. This is four years before the death of Pope John Paul II. He, so he writes this book called The Spirit of the Liturgy. And he dedicates a whole chapter saying how something that needs to be corrected in the new mass is the direction of the priest. He says, it must be towards God. That's the way the Catholic Church has always offered mass. And then some of you may know, just recently, I think maybe less than a year ago, the cardinal prefect for the congregation of worship, uh, worship in the sacraments in Rome, Cardinal Sarah, an African, 
I mean, I was, I was, I was pleased. I mean, again, there's so much that needs to be done, but you know, beggars, you know, when you get a little uh, crumb, you say, well, thank you for the crumb, you know. Um, um, but, he, but, he, but, he, but he gave a directive and, and encouraged, not a directive, but he was encouraging priests. I think it was supposed to be for the first Sunday of Advent, maybe, I don't know, it was this past Advent or the one before, I forget, but saying, encouraging priests to offer Mass ad orientem, towards God. And then he got all this um, almost immediately. There's some something that comes out of the communications office of the Holy See, and you know the Pope saying, you know, I don't really listen to that. I mean, the things that are going on right now in the, in, in the Catholic Church, I mean, it breaks your heart. Um, even just real quickly, uh, I want to finish up here very, very soon. So I had, well, I had some a lot of examples, but we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna skip over them. We're gonna skip over them. I'll just say, I'll just say just a couple of final things. One of the things you'll notice in, in, in the traditional Latin Mass is when, when the, the priest, normally, I mean, pretty much the whole Mass, other than the sermon where he is directing himself to the faithful, he's looking towards God. And so his eyes are looking to heaven and to God. And so because of that, his eyes and his heart must be pure. And that's why in the traditional Latin Mass, the priest is praying prayer after prayer after prayer for purity so that he can go up to the altar of God, so that he can see God. And that's why when he turns to look at the faithful, he does, well, not to look at the faithful, he turns to direct a, to, to give a, direct, a directive to the faithful, Dominus Vobiscum, his eyes are downcast. Why? Because his eyes are not to be distracted from God by the profane world, by the miserable hearts that are out there. No, no offense. No, no offense intended. But, but realize what's happening. I mean, we're talking about truly being in the holiest of places, in the presence of God. To see God, you have to be pure. And, and seeing God at Mass, the more you see Him with faith, and the more you direct your prayers and your hearts to Him, not to the priest, but to God at Mass, that in turn is going to be purifying hearts. For sure. I'll just mention to you very, very quickly just four moments at Mass, because I think at these moments you can make a special effort to try to see God, to see our Lord, because He's truly present, and to, and to say, Lord, purify my eyes, purify my heart, so that I can love you more. And that's at the elevation, at the elevation, obviously, of the precious body of Christ, elevation of the precious blood. Also, when the priest shows the, the body of Christ to the faithful, et, et Annus day, right before Holy Communion, and when you actually receive Holy Communion. Try to make yourselves more aware of how precious these moments are and how, in order to draw more and more grace, your heart has to be pure. Your eyes have to be pure. So please, when you're at Mass, don't be getting distracted and looking at what everybody else is doing. Stay focused on what is the holiest. A lot more that I was going to say, but too bad for another occasion. I want to jump just real quickly and say just a few words, and this will be very quick. Don't worry, I'm finishing up. Those people that are keeping time, I'm aware that I'm at an hour and three minutes, so I will try and finish here within about three or four minutes. The last one is devotion to St. Joseph and the Holy Family. This is very, very significant because I told you that all of these things... Uh-oh. I forgot to say one thing. <laughs> no, I want to... You know what? Let me say this. Let me just really... This will take me... This, will, this is 40 seconds. Just real quickly. Real quickly, uh, relevant to the Mass and about seeing our Lord in purity. From yesterday's epistle... Daniel chapter 13, this was Saturday of the third week of Lent, on the purity of Susanna and the impurity of the two older men who had been appointed judges. There's a very important detail in that epistle, and it's a very important detail. This is what it is. Susanna looks up to God, eyes on God, and that's why she's pure. And the impure judges look away from heaven and don't look on God. They look to the world. This is the exact quote from the epistle. Quote, they were inflamed with lust towards her, and they perverted their own mind and turned away their eyes that they might not look unto heaven. Close quote. And then the quote for Susanna, quote, and she weeping. This is after the accuser, and she's, gonna, and she's been condemned to death. 
Quote, and she weeping looked up to heaven for her heart had confidence in the Lord. Close quote. Her heart was pure. Her heart previously had been looking to God and it, and, and, and it was fixed on God. And the holy sacrifice of the Mass is supposed to be doing this constantly, constantly, constantly. The new Mass has lost it. So, um, back to, real quickly, devotion to St. Joseph and the Holy Family. Straight from Our Lady of Fatima. I'm going to read to you a real good book. If you, have you, if you haven't read this book, get it before you leave. Read it, please. Um, it's on the message of Fatima. I'm going to read straight from it here. Page 53. This is on October 13th, 1917. Right at the beginning of the miracle of the sun, the great miracle of the sun. This is what also takes place. There's a manifestation of St. Joseph and the Holy Family. The echo of Lucia's shout came back in a huge, immense cry of wonder and astonishment from the multitude. It was at this precise moment that the clouds were quickly dispersed and the sky was clear. The sun was now pale as the moon. And the miracle is about to begin. But before, to the left of the sun, St. Joseph appeared holding in his left arm the child Jesus. St. Joseph emerged from the bright clouds only to his chest sufficient to allow him to raise his right hand, because he's got the child Jesus in his left, to raise his right hand and make together, together with the child Jesus the sign of the cross three times over the world. Saint Joseph, as St. Joseph did this, Our Lady stood in all her brilliancy to the right of the sun, dressed in the blue and white robes of Our Lady of the Rosary. A beautiful manifestation of St. Joseph and the Holy Family. And that St. Joseph, in the message of Our Lady of Fatima, is blessing the world with his, with, with, with his divine son. Blessing the world with what? In, in the context of today's talk, we could say with the grace of chastity. And you say, chastity, Father, uh, what does St. Joseph have to do with purity? Where have you been the last hour? <laughs> But just in case you've been gone, you have, you have a couple minutes to recover because I'm going to tell you real quickly what St. Joseph has to do with purity and it'll only take me a couple of minutes, so hold tight. Here we go. St. Joseph is the true spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary and so his vocation is to protect and defend her. St. Joseph's heart was so pure, set on God alone, that Mary, while she was totally his, could still belong totally to God. The two, Joseph and Mary, were united in a true marriage so that each might be closer to God with the help of each other. And think, closer to God, having a deeper and deeper reverence for his majesty. Concupiscence was extinguished in Joseph and his soul shone with brilliant purity when he came into the presence of the Blessed Virgin. It could not be that she should be loved by someone who was not perfectly chaste. We see in St. Joseph a totally purified soul, a soul in which sin has lost its power, a soul that lives only for God. St. Joseph lived as a perfect virgin in his marriage, and as he had the Son of God, always before his very own eyes. Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. He was always seeing God. Right there in his home. And St. Augustine asks, Was not St. Joseph completely taken up with unceasing contemplation of his God? How could he sin? In the holy house of Nazareth, there was no place for sin. All eyes and hearts were set on the Son of the living God. St. Joseph, always contemplating the Son of God. Naturally then, all pure, all holy, no lust, completely chaste. Just to go back for one moment, that's what's supposed to be happening at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. 
contemplating profoundly the presence of God, the sacrifice of our Savior on the cross. We catch a glimpse of Joseph's holiness or purity in the marvelous mystery that, this is the marvelous mystery, that Mary is all his, but for this, no less, all God's. In fact, by belonging totally to Joseph, Mary belongs to God even more than before. And it is when she became St. Joseph's wife that the great mystery for which she was created, her vocation, was accomplished in her. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Mary, Joseph experienced only God, and Mary experienced only God in Joseph. What an admirable mystery of pure love for God and neighbor. In this afternoon's sermon, I will speak about how the Holy Family teaches us what a truly pure love consists in. And we can have all the confidence in the Holy Family, that is the earthly trinity, because the life of the Holy Family is three hearts. The Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the Most Pure Heart of St. Joseph. Blessed be the Holy and Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God. Blessed be her immaculate heart, heart most holy, most pure, and most loving. O immaculate heart of Mary, make the heart of Jesus, together with thy rule, triumph in each of our hearts, marriages, and families. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.